when you read the end of the Bible, you get the distinct impression that that word is going to come up an awful lot when we sing in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles with me, please, to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. We just read through together the, what we call the prologue to John's gospel, the opening portion of it. And I want us to turn our focus within that prologue to verses 1 and 2 of John chapter 1. You've, you've already read it. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. We read over that. We know that. We've heard it. It's a, I told you last week, it's, it's one of my favorite, this passage is one of my favorite uh, aspects of the so-called Christmas story, the narratives about the birth, coming of Jesus Christ. Because you see, this tells us, we're going to be looking the next three Sundays, Lord willing, that, at the birth and childhood of Jesus Christ. But this one tells us that this, his birth and childhood was preceded by his eternal fellowship with God. And we've got to get that right. In fact, I would submit to you, if we don't get that right, then we miss Christmas completely. Miss it completely. Next week, we'll take up the this idea of the birth and childhood of Jesus Christ that was prophesied in the Old Testament. It, Many, many prophecies foretold his, the event of his birth. And on the 28th, we'll take a look at the responses. His birth and childhood, his coming was met with varied responses all the way from worship to wickedness. We'll take a look at those in the future. But what I want you to see today, just for a few minutes together, is in these two verses, we see that, first of all, John's life can be traced all the way back to the beginning. Jesus' life, pardon me, can be traced all the way back to the beginning. And the second thing, that Jesus experienced a personal relationship with God in eternity past. Third, that Jesus was and is God. And fourth, Jesus existed as a person in eternity past with God. So those may sound a little bit alike, but you're going to see the, that they're really speaking of a different aspect of the same marvelous reality. If you read on down in this passage, as we read a while ago, down through verse 5, you see that he was, this, this word was in, very active in creation. And so writers who write commentaries about books of the Bible point out that if you look at the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's called the Septuagint. You probably know that, that the Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew. But there came a time when some scholars translated the Old Testament from Hebrew to Greek because Greek was the dominant language of all the world. And so what they, what they gave us was called the Septuagint. There, was, there were 70 scholars who undertook the looking at the Hebrew text and then the Greek equivalent of it. So when you look at the Greek version of the Old Testament, you know, Genesis 1-1 starts out, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That, that phrase, in the beginning, is the very same exact words used here in John's Gospel, in the beginning. And they point out that, that while Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell the Gospel story, the good news of Jesus coming, for different reasons, trying to get us a, a good chronology of it. John is not so interested when he writes in chronological events. He's, he is interested in point, painting a portrait, a mosaic of Jesus. And he wants you to see, first of all, that when he talks about the Word, whom we discover as we read on down in the passage, he's talking about Jesus that he's talking about this, the creator who comes to recreate. And I won't belabor that. There'll be a time in the future when we will study 
those early chapters of John and you'll see that, that John writes in such a day that he actually captures a time sequence of the first seven days of Jesus' ministry as if to say just as God created in seven days so Jesus comes to establish himself as the recreator in these significant seven days early ministry. But today for our purposes as we think more intensely about the birth of Jesus Christ than perhaps we do at other times of the year. All the trimmings are there. You see many manger scenes. We contribute our own manger scene up here. If your children want to take a look at it after the service, you're going to notice something missing. It is indeed a stable trough would qualify for the designation of manger. It's filled with hay. There's no baby. And there's a reason there's no baby. I've told you this through the years. Because Jesus did not stay a baby. He grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and men. And you would think something really strangely wrong with me. If you encountered me and I wanted to tell you about the birth of our first child, the birth of our son, Joshua. And I would talk about all the events surrounding that birth and would even pull out a, a photo album to show you pictures of, of his birth and the early pictures in the nursery at the hospital and went on and on and on about him and you would finally say, Preacher, we know him. He's, he's sitting right out there. I mean, what are you showing us all this for? He's grown up. He's not the little, he's not baby Joshua anymore. And we want you to think about that. You say, well, isn't that obvious? I would submit to you it's not obvious to a lot of people you encounter week to week. And there was a time in our country, by the way, when, when admiring baby Jesus was acceptable. Well, that's being challenged at every turn today. It's offensive. And while that may trouble us and offend us that, that celebrating and recognizing the birth of Jesus is offensive, Dear people, let me tell you something. A negative reaction to the birth of Jesus Christ is better than no reaction at all. Give me an angry response to a yawn any day. Because an angry response says they're getting something of the message. And so we celebrate here the birth, the childhood, the coming of Jesus Christ. But before we can really celebrate his birth. We need to acknowledge him for who he says he is in the scriptures. John tells us here that Jesus' life can be traced all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, this was the word. This phrase, in the beginning, points to a time prior to creation. The very language and the way it's structured is talking about before creation. Not in the beginning when God said let there be light because what we discover when we read Colossians and other passages is that, that Jesus is the architect of creation. That he who would come to be the light of the world was making the world. John goes on to tell us. So get this down. When you speak of Jesus, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, don't make the mistake that some groups make when they argue that he only became the Son of God, that this being that was born in Bethlehem became the Son of God at that point. There was a major heresy in the early church called Arianism. It still manifests itself today in some circles in various cults. But it taught that the babe of Bethlehem sort of became a person that God was willing to use for a season. He, the Spirit descended on him in the, in the waters of the Jordan and the Spirit left him on the cross, ascended away. And it, God kind of borrowed the, the body, the life of Jesus for a little while to make his redemptive point. No, no. The Scripture won't allow for that. 
before time was the Word. And this idea of the, the Word, while the focus of this verse is to show that the Word's, pre, the word's preexistence was before time, the idea of the Word, or the word logos, if you've seen that, conveys the notion of, of a divine self-expression of speech. And you see something about how God expresses him and reveals himself in speech, obviously in creation. But in Psalm 19, that psalm should be familiar to many of us, verses 1 to 4, the heavens declare the glory of God. So the heavens, the sky above proclaims his handiwork. We, we see in the very creation of God the declaration, there is a God. Paul says the same thing in Romans. What may be known about God is clearly made known. So that you have to deny, think about this, you have to deny the way you were made, the way you were created, because God has placed eternity in the heart of every one of us, and you have to deny that. You have to, you have to so overpower that with sinful neglect and despising to think that there is no God. There was an article that came out this week if you read it or not, said, there may not be any real atheists after all. It's a fascinating article. Because atheists believe something. So John is driving at great lengths this divine word, this logos. And it's unique to John, by the way. When you read the other gospel accounts, John is the only one who claims that the word is more than spokenness from God. That the word is God. The word is personal. We're going to see this. And John picks up this theme, by the way, in Revelation chapter 19. Again, he's the only one who uses the, the term word this way. Verse 13 of Revelation 19, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God, the Logos. Now, the Logos came the first time in very inauspicious settings, so much so that the, that the, the schools of training for Judaism despised the notion that their Messiah would come first of all from Bethlehem, even though their own prophet said, out of you, Bethlehem Ephrathah will come one who will rule the nations. Even though Bethlehem was the city of David, they still despise the notion that someone born under curious circumstances in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, could possibly be their Messiah. But when he comes in Revelation 19, there'll be no doubt by anybody. No more doubting. No more doubting. Paul says to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 2 that at that point every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. And acknowledge that this one who was in the beginning with God emptied himself and came in the likeness of human flesh. So there is this, this reality that I want you to get Jesus' life can be traced back, all the way back to the beginning. The eternal preexistence of Jesus. We've got to teach this to our children. They will not get it clearly anywhere else today. They will more than likely bump into a sentimental approach to the birth of Jesus that will ooh and ah over the babe in the manger and not be pressed to think, where did this babe come from? He didn't just begin to be. He only manifested himself that way, having existed for all of eternity. The next thing I want you to see is that Jesus experienced a personal relationship with God in eternity past. In the beginning was the Word, this text tells us, and the Word was with God. And when you take that idea of with God, the, the, the preposition here tells us the Word was face to face with God. And when that image is used in the Scripture, it's talking about relationship. It's talking about fellowship. 
Jesus is not, as some of the cults taught, and some still teach today, was not some sort of a, of a ghostly emanation. He had a personal relationship with God the Creator, with Elohim, the Word, this divine Logos, was with God. You see, so when he left heaven and was born in Bethlehem from the womb of Mary, who had never had intimate relations with a man, and as he grew, he grew with a hunger to fellowship with the God whom he left. And you see this. You see this in his childhood when they take him uh, upon his bar mitzvah, when they take him at the age of 12 to the temple. He's become a man of the community now. He, he needs to step up and, and, and hang with the men and learn with the men. Parenthetically, Judaism in, in Jesus' time didn't know about teenagers. The, the idea, you know, is, it's the term teenager is from tween. They're, they're tween between childhood and adulthood. When a young man hit 12 in the Jewish community, he experienced a, a bar mitzvah, a son of the, of the covenant experience. He was celebrated as a, as a little man. They went to the temple, remember? They headed back home. Great special occasion. Our firstborn son, Jesus, made his first trip to the, to the temple as a man of the community. To take in all the sights and sounds of it. No longer a child. On the way back, one, you've done this before, one assumed the other had them. I think I've told you before, Karen and I were coming back from a youth camp trip in Panama City Beach, Florida, one year. We had several vans. We stopped, I think, in Pensacola and inquired, where's Jason? She said, I thought he was with you. I said, well, I was pretty busy. I thought he was with you. What we realized was he wasn't with either one of us. Now that was before cell phones and when your little hand radios, they didn't go very far at all. We had several other vans on the road. They chose not to stop. So is he with them or did we leave him in Panama City Beach? So we decided surely he's with one of our vans and we took off to try to catch them, which we never did. Errol Hulse, my friend from England, was traveling with us. He barely survived the trip because I've never driven so fast in all my life. And we raced into Clinton. And unbeknownst to us, the other vans had pulled off the highway to stop along the way. So we're the first van back. By a pretty good measure, by the way. And we wait. And they pull in the parking lot finally. And Jason steps off in a collective sigh of relief that we didn't have to drive back to Panama City Beach to try to find him after him being there several hours by himself. Well, they, they each thought the other had him. He was with, Mary thought he was with Joseph. He's a man of the community. Joseph thought, well, I thought he was with you. He, you know, he's, he's fond of you. He's... Well, they turned around and they went back. You know, they found him conversing with the scholars. The picture we have is that he was answering questions that astounded them. You know, you know the, the impudent child who adults are conversing and asking things, the deep questions, and this child speaks up and answers. And then maybe he even asked some questions that they couldn't answer. Confounding the scholars. And they took him 
And as anxious parents, because, you know, we, we had real mixed emotions. We wanted to hug Jason. We wanted to spank Jason. They said, where were you? And his answer, didn't you know? Should it surprise you that I was simply doing my father's business? I was thinking about my father. His whole childhood was taken up with that. We see it in his adulthood. After a long day of ministry, when the disciples would be tired just from the weariness of the walking, not to mention the press of the crowds, and they would fall asleep, and Jesus would go all over to a place by himself and pray all night, fellowshipping with the Father. He was with God. He had an eternal relationship with God and was willing to limit the nature of that by coming to earth, Paul says in Philippians, emptying himself of those kind of privileges and prerogatives. And the third thing we're told here, not only that in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God, but the Word was God, or God is the Word. Some people argue and say, now wait a minute, if it was talking about Jesus being divine, it would have said the Word was the God. No, that would confuse the natures. Because you see, here's the mystery that we must just embrace because it's taught in the scriptures and no, no mere mortal mind has ever figured it out. Many explanations have been attempted and I'll have to commend some people who've done some great argumentation from the scripture for the doctrine of the Trinity, the triunity of God, God, one God in three persons. God was God. Jesus was God. Well, then, the Muslims say, You're, you worship more than one God. You're polytheists. No. We believe the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Deuteronomy 6. There's one God. There's one God in three persons. And they're not simply relationships, as some like to say. Well, you know, it's like, it's like I'm a father to my children. I'm a son to my parents, and I'm a husband to my spouse. So that's kind of like Father, Son, Holy Spirit. No, that's inadequate. The Word, the Logos, whom we'll find down in John chapter 1, and we'll be looking at this in the next couple of Sundays, was himself God. If our children ask, when did Jesus begin to be? The answer we've got to give them, he's always been. Right? He's always been. We simply got to know him in a different way when he was born in Bethlehem, but he's always been. Well, when did Jesus become God? He's always been God. He's always been divine. Well, I don't understand that. Well, that's probably because God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are the ways and thoughts of God above ours. And we simply come by faith to say, I don't understand it. It's not within my, my realm of, uh, of, of capacity to make sense out of it. But I see the scripture teaches it. And so I just in awe and wonder say, so Jesus... Fellowship with God face to face before there ever was anything we know to be a world. Before there was an earth. And the baby of Bethlehem came. Leaving that wonderful union and communion face to face with the Father, with God the Father and came to earth. God himself. Jesus would say to the 
Jews, the Jewish leaders in John chapter 8, when they got into the big controversy with him, he said, understand this, before Abraham was, before Abraham existed, I am. I existed before Abraham. And the final thing I want us to see for just a few minutes, Jesus existed as a person. He was in a person, personhood. You see, when he did some, he wasn't some ghost floating around. Jesus, he was in the beginning. He, personality, was in the beginning with God. So while we may be surprised that, he, that God sent his son to earth as a baby born in a, in a stable where there were animals, that he didn't come into a palace. We might be surprised about that. We should not be surprised that God sent Messiah as a real person. And there he is. Before we can talk about his birth and early childhood, we've got to acknowledge that he, he was and is before any of these trappings take place. This is your Savior. Not just a baby who grew up, not simply a baby, I say simply, simply a baby who did not sin all of his life growing up, but God who humbled himself. As Josh spoke a while ago, what humiliation. When you've had all of eternity, angels worshiping and adoring and serving you. No wonder, no wonder the scripture says that when Jesus came to earth, angels were, were peering out of heaven, they looked they look to see, how can this be? How can this, the beloved, the Lord's beloved, be in the body of a baby in a manger? That's why you get the impression that they couldn't wait to tell about it. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. It's, it's, you, this picture in my mind is that, this, that the, the declaring angel comes and says to the shepherds, stop being afraid, stop being terrified. I'm bringing you good news that if you'll hear it will bring you great joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And you'll find him in swaddling clothes wrapped up like a, little, a newborn baby in a stable. And I get this picture as he's announcing that and the, and the angelic host is just peering over that somebody pushes somebody out and they just all fall out and fall around him. That's what I see. And suddenly there was with him a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory, glory to God who reigns in the highest of places. Oh, and know this, that here on earth, this lowly place, there is peace for those on whom his favor rests. This God, the Creator, has sent his Son. And if you will receive him by grace through faith, the peace of God will be upon you and his favor will be upon you. And you will not be an enemy of God. That's what's going on there when they make that declaration. The Word. Oh, when you have an opportunity to talk about the Christmas story, whether it's in your family gatherings or with just little, little grandchildren, little children around, please tell them it didn't begin in Bethlehem. Please tell them and we simply see in Bethlehem the Savior who for all of eternity was worshipped by angels, fellowshipping face to face with God the Father, agreeing to come in our likeness, to start out like we start out, and to grow like we grow, except when, as we grow we learn sin. As he grew, he learned suffering without sin. Behold, your king, Bethlehem's babe, 
Calvary's crucified Savior. Heaven's returned beloved sitting at the right hand ruling and reigning. Worship him and all of who he is this season. Let's pray.